Well, welcome everybody. I'm Christina Henderson, Executive Director of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Welcome to our webinar, Two Bear Capital, Why Montana, Why Now? Transformational Opportunities in Life Science with Mike Gogan. This event is part of a series of free webinars the Alliance is hosting in April and May. You can find the full schedule and recordings at mthitech.org slash webinars. And we'd like to thank the Board of the Alliance and our members for making this series possible. Today, we're pleased to welcome venture capitalist and philanthropist, Mike Gogan. Mike is the founder of Two Bear Capital and Whitefish and a 20-year veteran of Sequoia Capital. He led investments across sectors, including cybersecurity, bioinformatics, biopharma, IT infrastructure, and semiconductors. Uh, we'll be conducting this webinar um, in a Q&A format. So if you have questions during the program, please type them in the chat box or in the Q&A tool. And I also have a few questions that we collected in advance. But before we dive into that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Mike for him to offer a few opening remarks and hopefully share his screen. That's right. Welcome everybody. Wish I could see you. I'll just pretend I'm looking at the sea of happy faces. Uh, some of you may have been in attendance, I think it was about a year ago, when we did a little bit of a, you know, grand reveal uh, of uh, Two Bear Capital, when we had some of the folks on the team on board already, we've added some more. So I thought I'd start by just giving you guys a quick update of uh, who we are, what we're doing, and maybe what's changed since last time, and then we can delve into the questions. So here's where I'm going to try the share screen. We'll see if this works uh, and tell me if it's working. It's working, thumbs up. I think it's working just fine, yep. Great, so I'm taking some of the, the pretty shots from our now active website. We do have a website, Tuber Capital. Feel free to check it out. And I think we just actually linked our companies uh, onto the website. That's a new development this past week. But um, I've always liked this picture, reminds me of Liz Markey, who's the person responsible for connecting us all together. Uh, I don't know why, I always think that's Liz looking off into the sunset or into the, the beautiful landscape. Um, but we mentioned last time that one of the visions here is to create not only the way we put it, not only the next 50-year uh, top-tier venture capital firm, uh, which um, you might guess comes from where I came from, which Sequoia Capital has been around 47 years near the top of the stack and the head of front row seat for 20 years as a managing partner. So I think I understand the formula pretty well and uh, we wanna replicate the good parts and uh, but have a little bit more of a, a why focus to what we do. And what that means is the companies that we focus on and we fund and we try to grow into giant companies, I want them obviously to be ones that are massively successful uh, financially and as investments, but we also wanna make sure they're companies that do something important. And one of the ways we accomplish that pretty easily is by picking the right sectors. But if we pick sectors that, uh, that sort of inherently uh, contain companies that are trying to do something really good, um, then uh, that's an easy extra checkbox. So these are the sectors we focus on. I guess the, the theme that knits them all together uh, is kind of a convergence of, of biology, healthcare, and computing, and IT, and, and uh, this, we can get to the why now a little bit more later, but uh, I think the world understands a little bit better than they did a month or two ago why biology is so important and um, how it can massively affect us all for good and bad. So I think we picked the right sectors and uh, there's a little bit more evidence of that that I can talk about. But, um, you know, biotech can span either biopharma. Our, our guess is that, uh, or our plan is that it'll be some true biopharma companies uh, that will fund. And there's a few examples of what we have already in our initial fund. Uh, but maybe about 20% of what we do will be true biopharma. But that also includes molecular diagnostics. And we have a really important company in that space, bioinformatics. Uh, for all of you not that familiar with the term, that's, that's uh, the, the genomic sequence in, uh, revolution um, when the Human Genome Project first decoded the first human genome. And, and as you might be familiar, the cost of sequencing went from the billions when that project was done down to um, getting closer to a hundred dollars, I think it's still closer to a thousand, but that massive drop has caused sequencing of just about everything, agriculture, life, and so on. That data, it, that the study of that data, the interpretation of that data is called bioinformatics. And it's super critical because that's really where we decode the code of life 
healthcare IT, a lot happening there. Um, you know, COVID is a good example of why there needs to be an awful lot of improvement in healthcare, not in terms of the care that's provided, but uh, I'm on the board of KRH, some of you are familiar with that, and with a front row seat of how uh, the stresses that, that, that healthcare is under from a financial point of view, operational point of view, and then a crisis like COVID really exacerbates problems that were already there, it screams out for new solutions. So I think there's big opportunities there. Um, machine learning and AI, kind of a horizontal uh, technology breakthrough, uh, but it really is just barely being applied now with huge uh, runway ahead of it to a bunch of areas, not the least of which is healthcare and bioinformatics and biology. And then information security sort of pervades everything. So those are sort of the themes that you'll see us focus on in the next decade or two. Um, some additions to the team, you've seen a few of these faces before, I put the location as well. So we have the two bookends here, uh, Whitefish, Montana. We have a good chunk of folks at our headquarters in Whitefish. Uh, Seth and Alex are our Silicon Valley outpost, um, both super brilliant uh, technologists. Uh, Seth is our most recent. So Seth was a really high profile guy at Stanford uh, where he was one of the leads group leaders of a, a core part of what was called the ENCODE project. So for those of you who were familiar with the Human Genome Project, which was a decade or two ago, a couple decades ago, when we decoded the human genome. Um, the, the one realization after that project was that, gee, only 1.5% of the base pairs uh, actually code for genes. At first, the rest of it was called junk DNA until they started to realize that, wait a minute, that the rest of it's really important. It's the regulatory region. It's called epigenomics. It, it basically is all the important stuff that codes for things that aren't genes, but controls the whole biological system. So disease is now correlated strongly with what's in the rest of that region. The ENCODE project was about a four or $500 million government project um, that was sort of home run at Stanford. All the data had to go to Stanford and Seth headed up the program that sort of collected all and interpreted that data and did something with it. So we're super happy to have Seth. Um, he's been amazing. I think he's on the line, so he's probably turning red. We have Alex, who I mentioned last time, but just to sort of drive home the point, Alex really is an icon in machine learning. It was his thesis in 2012 uh, that is credited with sort of starting the modern AI revolution because prior the, the notion of neural networks and the, the models, um, thanks to his professor, uh, Jeff Hinton, very famous computer scientist, were thought to be promising, but no one really had shown amazing results yet. So it was Alex's work that showed this stuff can really uh, do amazing things in computer vision and elsewhere. And, and it began this revolution. And he spent the next five years at Google uh, and now he's with us. And the rest of the team, we have amazing biology folks. Uh, in addition to Ryan, who you met, who's gonna be an all around sort of uh, A plus athlete, AI learning fast about healthcare. In fact, he's assigned right now to become the expert in healthcare, uh, healthcare tech um, and all the craziness in, in the way payments work and, and that sort of thing. So anyway, very wounded out team, the companies, uh, first the geography, sorry. Uh, so we are Montana based, Montana focused. If we could wave a magic wand, we'd have every company in Montana, but uh, you know, we have pretty big funds and uh, we know that isn't quite possible. So Northwest, uh, Montana, as many as we can, some in the Seattle area, some Silicon Valley, some San Diego, heavy concentration of biotech there. Rachel on the last slide was in uh, San Diego, is located in San Diego. We might have another hire there as well. Um, and occasionally we do companies in New York. Speaking of the companies, uh, with the $15 million two bear capital seed fund one, uh, which is a fully invested fund, we have a couple of really high profile bio companies, biotech companies right here in Montana. Um, Spesicor is amazing, uh, associated with, uh, well, both on the periphery of U of M, both at Montech, um, do all kinds of amazing neuro breakthrough work, um, all kinds of things, epilepsy, uh, neurodegeneration, um, uh, central nervous system injuries, spinal cord injuries, re nerve regeneration, amazing things. Biodiagnostics is a molecular diagnostic company. And let me spend a second here because you might've just seen the press release. Uh, so when COVID started, we got all our brainiacs together, including all our, yeah, all our companies and even a prospective company that we're doing in the, in the main fund. And everybody focused on what could we do about COVID. Uh, turns out, FIRE, the purpose of the company, the reason it started in the first place was 
basically alternative reactions to PCR, to the traditional real-time PCR for uh, sort of higher fidelity um, in, uh, I guess, more expanded testing, easier testing uh, of, uh, of biomarkers, microRNA, picoRNA, all that kind of stuff. And the brilliant founders there decided they could alter one of their processes and do a rapid test for COVID. And the press release was on that, I think yesterday, the day before, and it is looking amazing. So we've been working with all the institutions across Montana, all the healthcare institutions, trying to solve that urgent problem of mass testing, mass scalable testing, uh, very high fidelity tests, and uh, doesn't require the real-time PCR machines, uh, low cost, easily scalable. We're excited as, as heck about that. Spiral Genetics is in Seattle. This company has some software to decode a big chunk of the genome that in a better, more accurate fashion than anybody else has become critical to the COVID fight as well. XIX is our uh, computer vision company. Uh, there's an angle there as well, which people are talking about now, no touch uh, biometrics, you know, post COVID, which if we ever have a post COVID, uh, you know, you're looking for technologies where how can I do things like authentication without a lot of physical touch. Um, and then the last couple, Pulse Data is in New York. So Pulse Data are a super exciting company, growing fast. It's aiming right at one of those key healthcare problems I talked about, a payment model change that put pre-COVID, like the systems are in incredible stress now with COVID, but even pre-COVID, there were changes in the payments, the way that, um, uh, that, that CMS in particular, Medicaid, Medicare was gonna reimburse hospitals. Uh, I think there were positive changes. There were good changes, but they were different and new for hospitals. So suddenly, bam, huge strain on a big chunk of their finances. And this company comes along with technology to help out. Uh, verifies a local company doing fraud prevention detection. Uh, it's just important generically. It fits in, in in a way I can explain at some point. XD Bio is another whitefish company. And they are, if you guys know GitHub, if you ever heard of GitHub, it was actually a Sequoia company sold for $7 billion, I think, to Microsoft. Um, so it's sort of the GitHub for bioinformatics now with a special COVID twist. So Seth is working with Carl, is the, Carl and Tim, the founders, and they're getting them in the flow. The purpose there is to try to try to help fix the problem of for COVID, for the next version of COVID, for the next SARS related potential pandemic, how do we help the world's ecosystem remove friction from getting the bioinformatics, the, the latest information on the, the gene sequences, the RNA gene sequences, and every mutation that's discovered. How do we quickly get that on common platforms that everybody has instant access to so we can get the world's brains on it? So anyway, that's where we're at now. We're we've doing a, a, a kind of the big fund now, and we've already made our first commitment, another Missoula company, uh, really interesting company, not quite announced yet, but working actually on vaccines and uh, for COVID, among many other things that we were already excited about, and that work looks super promising. So I'll stop screen sharing. Uh, that was the intro. Well, that's a fantastic intro. Thank you, Mike. Um, so first question we have is, from your vantage point as a longtime business advisor and investor, how would you describe what you're seeing among companies during the COVID-19 crisis? Well, um, I, I was at Sequoia uh, for a good 20 year chunk, 96, 2016. And, and if you recall that caught at least, at least two sort of big bubbles and big crashes. So the dot-com crash, telecom crash, 2000, 2001, and, uh, and then to the 2008 crash. So I've been telling my companies and, and any entrepreneurs who are curious, the, sort of what happens on the VC side in general. So what happens uh, to, especially the funds that are up and running and, and have tons of portfolio companies at all various stages, very first reaction is freeze because the first thing they have to do is triage. They have to understand which of our companies are really in trouble because you know, if you've built your whole model on a pre-bubble bursting uh, ecosystem in terms of assumptions about rounds you're gonna raise and valuations and, and all that, uh, that all changes in a split second. So first thing VCs do is say, what kind of trouble am I in? So in terms of you're a company, you wanna go get VC funding, it's a tough time, partly for that reason. Um, well, actually the way I, I parse it even further, the Sequoia Capitals of the world, which I consider doing, you know, we, we consider ourselves doing it the, the smartest way, even we had to do that first. First step was, you know, triage. 
then a Sequoia Capital type firm would kick into a mode where, wow, it's actually a really good time to invest, right? Because, you know, there's a bit of a Darwinian filter, I used to call it, that swept across the ecosystem, meaning if there were too many Me Too companies in a category, suddenly there weren't because, you know, it's kind of like only the strong survive. In other words, only the best entrepreneurs, the grittiest, the best ideas, in some sense, even have the guts to try to get funding. The rest of them just pack up and go home. Um, and then, so you, you tend to get the bet, noise leaves the system, get better companies, you know, obviously from the VC side, the, the, if, if valuations have been super, super inflated, they're down. That's not good news for the entrepreneurial side, but you know, it's, it makes it a good time to invest. And we had good correlation between post crash companies we made our initial investment in and ultimate outcomes of those, some being some of the best, biggest companies. So that's sort, of, that's sort of one thing. If you're on the company side, by the way, obviously you have to do the smart thing right off the bat. You have to quickly figure out what were my assumptions going forward about hiring, burn rate, when I was going to raise money next and realize, you know, kind of just about everything changes. Um, we, we can talk more about implications of COVID. I think you hit it a few more times in your questions later. So uh, revisiting this idea, we just saw a New York Times story hit yesterday, uh, highlighting Montana as a, as a uh, new place, one of the new places in the interior of the country for venture capital investment. I've heard a number of other investors say that they think once COVID clears, places like Montana could be uh, very attractive for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the core questions in the title of this is why Montana, why now? What, what's your answer to that? Uh, it's obviously stronger why now, I think post COVID, but, but we have made the choice pre COVID. So, you know, we had a lot of logic beforehand already. The logic beforehand, uh, besides the fact that I'm super biased and in love with the place and I would have invented a rationalization if, if I had to, to as to why here, because this is, this is heaven on earth, I think. Uh, but uh, honestly, I think if you just watch the direction that places like Silicon Valley were going in terms of the increasing, it, it was heading for a pop, you know, it was heading for a bubble to burst in that traffic, uh, you know, uh, wages, rents, everything were just getting to that breaking point. Um, and I think the true, it was true in other highly dense, you know, urban areas that New York's and the Boston's and so on for, for in stars, startups. So already there was a, there was a uh, sort of, um, it was a force that said, gosh, you know, why does it have to be Silicon Valley? You know, we're in a world as we're all being forced to uh, live with right now where you can get a lot done remotely. So uh, if you know, the address, some employees in a dense location, the issue with Montana though was, uh, I always heard this. I heard this from folks on this, on this call, I bet, uh, that we always had a bit of a chicken and egg issue. We always had, you know, well, there's no companies because there's no venture capital and there's no venture capital because there's no companies and there's no big successful companies to shed people because they didn't start here in the first place, like this whole chicken and egg thing. So part of the game plan uh, when we thought about Tuber Capital is sort of plant the flag in a big way and, you know, bring in a lot of venture capital and to the state and start the engine working. What we found right off the bat, to my pleasant surprise, was it actually a lot easier than I even thought. Uh, to recruit people here and companies. I mean, we had Silicon Valley companies were funding and they took the idea of moving here pretty seriously. And I was pleasantly surprised. Now, post COVID, I just think it's easy, even easier for, for the reasons you were alluding to. Uh oh. Sorry, I thought I clicked and I did it. Now, is that better? Sorry yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, from the outset, Two Bear. Capital has focused on healthcare and biotech. You've highlighted some of the, the great companies you've already invested in. You've also mentioned plans for a biotech incubator uh, in Whitefish. Why did you target this space? I mean, in some ways, it's kind of inherent to the problems that we're all dealing with, which you implied earlier, but why did you target it? What are the opportunities you see? Has anything shifted for your team in the last few months in this biotech space? Well, I mean, I'll answer the first part which is I, I really believe that quote that, you know, sort of biology is the next computing revolution in a way. I mean, it shares some of the characteristics of when we uh, you know, had the transistor, had the semiconductor, had the first computer and what followed. Um, 
I feel like we're, we're at that, we're, the firing gun has started in biology in a similar fashion. I mean, take just for example, um, biopharma. I was sort of shocked as I built up my own depth in, the, in that space and expertise. I started with oncology, a big fixation on oncology. I was actually surprised how many drugs are on the market still to this day, where when you ask uh, the inventors, you know, you invest the chief scientific officer, okay, exactly how does this work? And their answer sometimes is, we're not sure. <laughs> you know, basically the, the, the history of sort of biopharma was more a little bit black box. It was, you know, it seems to do X, hence the big trials and, and the crossing your fingers that there aren't crazy side effects and so on. And, and drugs get approved or had gotten approved for decades that by that way, where it wasn't, you really didn't understand understand on a molecular mechanic level what was happening well then we shifted as, as and it, a big part of it was genomics you know when genomics really started to be understood we started to understand the code for a certain receptor on the on the surface of a cell and what an aberration that uh, part of the genome could do to make the receptors that are slightly different potentially identifiable as a sick cell or a cancer cell versus not and then you started to have with the advent of precision medicine, targeted therapeutics. And we started this shift into a world where, you know, at least uh, there's a design uh, thesis in mind uh, when you're designing, I'll take, for example, this immunology company, vaccine company. You know, they know what they're trying to do. They're specifically, in their case, designing molecules to exactly match certain receptors and to have certain molecular characteristics in their synthetic molecules to trigger explicitly uh, different, what they call pathways, uh, by the way, for you non-bio geeks, uh, I didn't understand the concept of what do you mean pathways? I was a networking guy from computer networking, right? And I was like, you mean there's actually sort of biological connectors? I don't understand. What, simply put, you know, si pro signaling pathway, signaling, uh, they use the word pathway a lot in biology. It simply means a chain reaction, if you will, of molecular interactions that when you draw it out on a whiteboard, you could almost draw, draw it like a network, you know, this turns into this, this turns into this, this turns into this. Anyway, we're now to the point where we're designing drugs, like explicitly intending this pathway to be chosen versus that pathway. And there's ways to actually validate. Yep, the drug actually did exactly that. So in such a record, a brand new world, add on top of that, just the pace of discovery. And then on top of that, the tools we have. We have tools that can do gene editing in a precision fashion, right? Oh my gosh. And people are, uh, to, to take my analogy earlier, literally people are actually talking about, you know, biological computing or biological, uh, you know, uh, synthetic biology is a big field where you actually take almost from a library, almost like computer software, library of genomic elements you want, um, you know, the genomic code and stitch it together and make the biological system do what you want it to do. I mean, we're just in this crazy time. Then on top of that, the, the, the impact on humanity, it's not just solving disease problems that we've had forever, where now there's a glimmer of hope that we can actually tackle them, you know, cancer or some of these really intractable problems. This is all making us aware we have to, we actually have to focus on that uh, or else, you know, this kind of thing just accelerates from a statistical point of view. Not to mention that biology translates easily also to the environment, environmental impact, uh, everything we worry about in the environment and sustainability of food and so on. That's all biology too. So I just think, I, I, I just already was a big believer this is where the action's gonna be, you know, going forward. This is where it's gonna shift to. Um, and then, uh, so, so I feel really good about that choice. And then this happens, so it's just accelerated things. So as you saw by some of the companies, but part of the answer to your question too was changing the last few months in the bio incubator, no real change other than maybe slight slowdown in pulling the trigger on a few things on the personal side, you know, philanthropic side that I was going to. But still the game plan is to get uh, some sort of incubator going uh, this year. That's still exciting. Uh, we also heard from you at the end of 2019 that you were planning to raise a whole new pool of money to invest in Montana and the Rocky Mountain West. Uh, at the end of 2019, uh, Montana saw more than $150 million invested in companies. Um, does this change that picture for 2020 uh, for startups that are looking to raise VC money? Uh, what is your outlook for venture capital? Uh, we, I mean, we can't announce certain things quite yet. Uh, there's a bunch of rules on that. Uh, but um, I say it is nice to say, yeah, that uh, there is going to be uh, you know, very significant 
increase. Uh, we've already seen it, not just with us, but we're going to uh, you know, be a big needle mover. Uh, pretty massive increase in the availability of venture capital uh, for Montana. But, uh, you know, it's also, but it's important to note that, that the, uh, a firm like ours, we're, um, we're, I expect to have kind of similar ratios to, to Sequoia Capital in terms of, you know, we saw, we'd see a lot, a lot of companies and invest in, you know, some very tiny percentage of, of the companies we saw. And, and it's kind of had to be that way if you want to really um, have, you know, what we used to call dent making companies, you know, just, it's gotta be sort of just the right combination. So it, what we've done though, and I've um, encouraged with everyone we've hired and hopefully you'll all steal this from us is uh, whether we, we choose to invest or not, in a particular company, we want to make sure we, we provide value. So, you know, I, with a lot of you, maybe this has already happened, hopefully it'll happen in the future. You know, we plan on doing a lot of interactions with lots of Montana companies. Um, and if it's not exactly for us, that's okay. We're going to try to boost your chances. You know, we're trying to try to give you advice almost as if we were the investor uh, to sort of help massively increase your probability of success, either of getting funding elsewhere or of reshaping the plan so that, you know, it is fundable or whatever. And we've done a lot of that already. Good news. Um, okay, I want to shift a little bit. We've had some questions submitted from participants, um, and I want to hit some of those. Uh, sure. So one is, biotech often takes years to develop and get approval before a product, pharmaceutical, or device is available to their market. At what point in a biotech company's lifespan launch, pre-sales, revenue, after X number of early stage customers, et cetera, are you investing? Well, I mean, our focus of the closed fund now, that $15 million fund was seed. It was explicitly a, a seed fund company. So it was, you know, pretty early, um, small number of people in the company. You know, uh, what, I've, what we've found, we've observed both down in San Diego and up here as well, and even in uh, Silicon Valley, the companies we've found in the sort of bio space. Uh, the scrappy entrepreneurs and the ones we like and are attracted to have usually done wonders with um, like grant funding. You know, they're usually the really good ones are kind of masters at the whole NIH process and so on. So, so it isn't that they haven't taken in funding yet. They've usually actually gotten reasonably far along in proving whatever their thesis is with grant funding. Uh, but now they want to sort of kick it to the next level. And that's where we've been in the seed fund. The, what we're investing now is more primarily series A focused. Um, some seed, some series B. Um, so how that translates to sort of a bio company. And, and you know, we're not going to, as I mentioned, it's going to be uh, um, a minority percentage of the, the, the companies we invest will be full on biopharma companies that have to go the whole FDA, you know, I'm, I'm putting a drug inside your body kind of process. Um, diagnostic testing companies will still have to go through their own process. Some other medical devices do. But but even so, all the companies that we fund it will have to go through a process that still will be less than 50% 50, 50 of the companies. Uh, but the answer to the question is um, we're doing uh, companies that in that space that are sort of heading to the initial part of their FDA process, you know, phase one kind of process. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from, uh, related to the job market. Uh, so. Prior to COVID-19 hitting, um, this, this folk person says, uh, there were a couple of articles I read about needing experienced tech employees in Montana, uh, then COVID-19 happened. Do you think it will be a long time before there is a big job market for experienced tech employment for those wanting to move to the area? Uh, no, I don't think it's been a long time. I mean, hopefully, hopefully you'll see a significant ramp up this year. Uh, in opportunities, you know, certainly for, for our companies and the companies we fund, um, we'll be hoping to attract uh, quite a bit of tech talent. You know, what, what I found, uh, even just focusing on the software side, for example, there seemed to be a lot of, um, sprinkled around, there was a lot of good programmers. Uh, the ones that were here, though, typically had jobs where they were working remotely, or let's say some big company, you know, somewhere else in the country, and which gets to be a bit of a, lonely process after a while. I think we're all feeling that right now. <laughs> you know, just working by yourself online is uh, perfect for some, but for others, you know, it's, it's, uh, can get a little old after a while. Um, so those, that, that's talent that's already 
available potentially to jump into you know exciting fast growing companies. Um, the other sort of zooming in a little bit on Montana um, particular problem we want to help solve is that uh, right now if you look at the state and let's say you did grow up in this part of Montana Flathead Valley and you uh, wanted to get into computer science programming there hasn't been a lot up in this part of the, the state um, maybe down in Bozeman maybe Missoula so one of the early things we're doing is filling that void and you know creating a a draw so that uh, heck we can recruit people from the Bozeman area up to here and recruit them in from other states. But certainly if you grew up around here or, you, or this was where your heart was, there just hadn't been any jobs, we're gonna help fix that. Uh, we've had a couple questions related to uh, higher education and how you engage with the academic community. Uh, you obviously some of the startups that you mentioned earlier are connected to Montech and University of Montana um, But broadly, how would you answer this question? And we also have some inquiries from um, an, a healthcare IT startup from MSU um, They have friends at Expesicorn Fire Diagnostics who are tied to UM researchers Would Two Bear consider advising the Montana University system on which research areas should be doubled down on at our universities? to be able to expand the research to company pipelines. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're incredibly uh, sort of, um, I don't know, uh, we're fixated on, on trying to bring up the university systems kind of, kind of with us. It's a critical part of the ecosystem. If you look back, in fact, uh, a lot of analyses decades ago about Silicon Valley tried to analyze why Silicon, why did Silicon Valley become Silicon Valley uh, or any other, tech ecosystem and oftentimes they said well it had to start with the university so that was a an assumed precondition in, in the case of Silicon Valley of course was Stanford um, and you know in our part of the country of the state anyway Northwest we don't have a big university so we wanted to sort of uh, disrupt that that thesis um, that you don't necessarily need the university kind of right there but statewide we we do so MSU U of M um, it's part of our mission in a way to um, sort of elevate uh, those two universities as high as they can possibly go. So short answer, yes, absolutely. We'd love to help and advise. And, and we work a lot with U of M. Seth Bodner's a great guy. And, and uh, um, on this COVID testing program, for example, uh, you know, we're, we're constantly looking for ways for the university to, to help and some of the core researchers they have there um, and facilities they have there and how, how that can help out. MSU is just further away, haven't been to it as much, but um, in fact, Expesicor, which you mentioned, that's the neuro company you talked about. Um, actually not Expesicor, I get the two mixed up, the two founders, they share founders, so it gets a little confusing in the fire that the diagnostic company uh, that's doing the COVID testing, when we originally invested, it, a lot of it centered around um, patent they had licensed from a brilliant female prof at MSU. So they, even though they run the Montech, you know, next to U of M, their, their core technology, a bunch of it was, was MSU related. So, you know, I think we have amazing potential at the two university systems. We also have, when we're doing a lot of work up here in the Flathead, um, you know, the, the Flathead Valley Community College has given me a whole new look at what what it could mean to be a community college because I just had the normal impression a lot of folks have around the country that oh that's the sort of also ran place that you know people go they can't get into college or something gosh Flathead Valley with Jane the, the president here completely changed, blew my mind I've I've gone there I've been a student I got my EMT there for for two area rescue uh, but she's having a lot of discussions about how do we have for example computer science degrees here whether it's they get accreditation or they do a joint thing with MSU or U of M but we want to bring a lot more uh, edu high tech, higher education, bioeducation, kind of right here to this part of the state as well. Fantastic. You mentioned uh, Two Bear Air Rescue. Uh, from the app, um, dial that back one second. So um, you have a long record as a philanthropist in the Flathead Valley. You mentioned Two Bear Air Rescue and, and also that you're on the board of trustees at Kalispell Regional Healthcare. Right. Um, you alluded to it earlier about the impact that COVID-19 is having on organizations like this that are on the front lines of saving lives. Could you dig into that a little deeper? What, what are you seeing and, and what do you think the impact will be? Uh, well, it's, um, 
you know, a lot of this has been, been sort of highly publicized. I think KRH, uh, Craig Lampert, the, the new CEO, who you know, helped to do the recruiting on him. Uh, he's been a, he, he was an ex-military commander, so he has a really great command and control style. And he's, I think Harry has been really good at communicating, you know, very frequent communication to the community. Um, so, so a lot of what they're going through is, you know, is, is quite public, but seeing up close KRH, Bozeman, all the other healthcare institutions, and then the exact same statements could be made nationwide about the healthcare uh, institutions. First, there was the, uh, the mass, you know, the, the surge overwhelming aspect of the, the critical patients that needed to be cared for, cared for. and given the virality of, of, of COVID, the virus itself, um, coupled with the lack of testing, let me tie it into testing, why that's a bit of a key and why we had so much fixation on trying to get mass testing spun up, at least in Montana, <clears throat> is if you're a giant healthcare system um, right now in the United States, or most of the world, because there isn't universal testing, easy, quick testing for everybody. And we can talk a little bit more about testing. There's a lot of confusion. There's tests out there that are these five minute blood tests getting talked about that can help detect antibodies, which your body only produces after a while of fighting something. In other words, they're not, they're not designed to be the detection test. You have COVID or not people in the general public confused about that. They're wonderful and super important role to figure out later who's immune and who's not, who might be immune. But the testing of who has an active virus has to be the, you're looking for the active virus particles. Um, and that's where we have worldwide, actually, this testing bottleneck. The technology is called real-time PCR or quantitative real-time PCR. In Montana, we have the state testing labs. Some of the hospitals have their own machines. Uh, worldwide shortage of the reagents, the chemistry that has to go into those things. Um, slow turnaround time, the actual testing process itself is a thermal cycling, 20, 30 cycles. It's uh, right now in Montana, if you have to send it to the state testing lab, you know, multiple day kind of turnaround. So because of that, because of the testing shortage, uh, world, worldwide, certainly the United States, we have uh, taken the approach that, well, since these tests are rare, let's only test sort of the sick people. Um, but all the data indicating right now is that 50 plus, some new data from the uh, U.S. military, the Navy, who test tested universal testing across one of the aircraft carriers had something like 60% uh, of the people who tested positive were asymptomatic. So the point is, there's a ton more people with it than are being tested. So back to the healthcare system, you're running this giant hospital. You don't know who's infected or who isn't in your staff or coming in the door. So you have to be cautious. You have to shut down all other elective surgeries, anything that's sort of optional gets shut down. Right. Guess what? That's where the hospitals make their only tiny little profit margin. I mean, hospitals are, I've learned up close, big top line revenue, really teeny profit margin. Right. So all of a sudden you're immediately losing millions, you know, very quickly. Um, and then the shortages of the PPE, the masks and everything are because you don't know who's infected or not. So everybody has to wear a mask. You know, everybody has to wear the highly protective gear. So the, the solution is if even starting with the healthcare systems, you had rapid, Universal testing. I mean, everybody who shows up to work gets tested 30 minutes later. Up, oh, you're good. You're not. Whatever. You could start to theorize of, hey, I can start to maybe reopen because what I could do is open up a big chunk of the medical campus. As you know, that's the everyone who goes in and out has been tested like repeatedly. Patients, whatever, they're good. I can save all the PPE gear for this part of the hospital. Let's say maybe a whole different building. That's the COVID. And you can take what I just described and apply it across Montana and apply it across the country and apply it across the world. So that's why you hear so much fixation about testing being the key. Um, because I gotta tell you that besides just the horror of like in New York of dealing with the patients and the death and, and all that, um, the hospital systems, healthcare system in the United States, they are facing a massive like uh, existential threat of just going out of like going bankrupt uh, fairly soon kind of unless, you know, things change. So anyway, that's why I did. that's why this massive urgency. We have a number of questions that are around specific technologies and whether you'd be interested in investing in them. And some of these, to be frank, are, um, I can't even pronounce the words that okay. they're <laughs> including. So what, what we'll do is we will, um, collect all the questions that have come in and forward them to you in text afterwards so that if so that you can um, 
uh, sort out what the specific technologies are. But to ask a more broad question that perhaps encompasses this larger group of companies and these specific technologies, what sorts of things are you interested in investing in through Two Bear Capital? And how might an entrepreneur that has a given technology, um, how should they approach you as a firm um, to see if, if it's a good fit? Well, let me address the, the last part first. Um, you know, you can always uh, reach us through the website and email, but in terms of, you know, improving your, your chances of really getting, um, of knowing you're hitting the mark, uh, if we don't have it already on our website, we, we will shortly, it's kind of modeled after Sequoia and a lot of the VCs in Silicon Valley did something similar, which is that it posts like a little primer, you know, here, here's the elements that you should make sure you think about, you know, that you have and sort of a little primer on, on you know, uh, sort of a business plan primer of have you talked about, you know, competition, market size, blah, 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 blah. So we should have a little helper primer if we don't already um, on our website soon. So that's one answer. But um, I covered some of the areas that we'll be focused on most. So simple filter would be if you're a Montana entrepreneur and not even close to any of those areas, you know, you want to open a pizza shop or something. I, I, I wish you the best. We need more pizza in Montana, but it's probably not something we would fund from, you know, and on a friendly basis, maybe we could you know, give your word to advice or point you in the right direction. Um, but let's say that it's a technology company and it's getting kind of close to our area. You know, we're trying not to be too, too strict about the categories. Um, you know, you, you don't want to exclude things that might be, wow, that's, that sort of an, uh, doesn't exactly fit in one of our labels, but boy, it's close to the theme. And the theme for us is first all the basic stuff. Uh, you, you, let me back up for a second. There were a lot of firms that uh, starting in about the mid 2000s said they were gonna be impact firms. You know, we were gonna be do-gooder firms. I might've given this feel last year. I'll just repeat it. Uh, and, and there's plenty out there and they're funded and they get, you know, they're on the third or fourth or end fund. So the problem in, in my mind and in the mind of the limited partners, the endowments that give the money is that in general, those all have the reputation as being really noble, but they're pretty terrible performance. You know, they don't ever generate returns. And that's, you know, in some sense, okay, the, the giant LPs, endowments, foundations, whatever say, well, I'm kind of checking the box at least to try. I don't think it has to be that way. And we don't think that has to be that way. So our thesis is a little different. Our thesis is, we wouldn't invest in anything that wouldn't pass muster if I were back at Sequoia, you know, in terms of having all the right elements that, wow, you address a massive market pain. It is a, you know, much better solution. I could see why they're going to be big pull for what you have. You know, it really is sort of a, all the parameters are correct, you know, of building a big company. Oh, by the way, does this company matter? You know, that's our extra filter that maybe doesn't exist in some of the VC from Silicon Valley. Our extra filter is, Okay, now that I checked all those boxes, I could see how you could become a giant company financially, success-wise, is what you're doing something that, you know, we kind of think is really important. And the ones we'll say no to, maybe it'd be, I, I don't know, sometimes I pick on ad tech or something, you know, hey, we'll have to advertise better. Awesome, you know, I bet you can get picked up for Facebook for a billion dollars or something down the road, but it's probably not for us. Uh, but if it's, hey, there's this massive problem in this industry or that industry, and here's how, you know, we can massively help it get better um, than it could be for us. So sorry if that was a little vague, but the problem is that they they come up in all different areas. So you can't give a real right. blank yes. statement. Uh, so we we're down to the last minute. Um, I will say um, before I turn the floor over to you to close this out, that we are recording this webinar. We will transcribe it and we'll also collect all the questions and uh, share them with you and with the listeners so they can um, have this as a resource following up. But as a final, I would like you to have the final word, Mike. Um, on your website, it reads, from here, we can see the future. Any final words about what you see in the future uh, at this present moment? Well, I think uh, some aspects of the future, I think to me, have become more clear, uh, could become more clear to all of us if you think about what we're going through right now. This isn't, um, you know, it's not a blip. It's uh, this once in a hundred year kind of event. If you think about different points in history when sort of suddenly there's a shift and I clearly think we're 
in one of those phase changes. So you have to think about, well, what's the new, uh, the new future look like and how does this, what we're going through affect it. And I think for one, it, it sort of validates our theme. I mean, it does shift a lot more uh, attention span to, uh, to human health, to biology, to a lot of the sciences that, that you know, we're spending a lot of time focusing on. Um, it does uh, dramatically point out sort of inefficiencies in, in what we've uh, had as, as critical parts of, you know, worldwide infrastructure before and relating to some of the points I made earlier about even just the flow of information, critical information in the, uh, that benefits the human race, you know, why is it the way it is? Uh, in terms of its inefficiency and so on, there has to be better systems going forward. I think the stress, that extra stress that's put on healthcare, which is a trillion dollar industry, by the way, guys, uh, is uh, just really amplifies the problems that are already there, but all of a sudden you take sort of a, a weakened, it's kind of like when you have a weakened immune system and then you get attacked by a virus, not to overplay this yucky analogy, but you know, obviously you're going to get sicker, right? Well, the healthcare system already had fundamental, you know, massive issues in it. And then a big shock to the system like this just reveals them in a really dramatic way. So I think my point is there'll be a lot of it more recognition that all these things are, are really important. I guess the, the message I'd leave the entrepreneurs with is just think about whatever it is you're, you're starting and uh, obviously try to do something you're passionate about. We always say the best entrepreneurs are somebody who's solving a problem they're close to. Instead of sort of intellectualizing, gee, what do I want to start a company to do? We used to get the slick, we used to call them the slick Stanford Business School people. I went to Stanford, so I shouldn't bash it, but the slick Stanford Business School students coming out who just said, I want to start a company. I don't know what, and top down did intellectualize a company and have a super slick pitch. We weren't that crazy about them because what we wanted was the entrepreneur that maybe did their whole degree in some area, science or math or, or machine learning or whatever, and they came up with a, a way something could be better, right? They breathe the problem or maybe it's a uh, maybe it's you're on the customer side maybe you spent your whole career and you know that if only in this giant industry we had X and you start to try to fix it yourself so find a problem you're passionate about but the, our final litmus test you can just use yourself is like you know how really important is this problem and, and the more important the problem is uh, the more interested folks like we will be uh, and you know if you think about it in terms of your own legacy that the potential bigger dent you can leave on the universe, as they say, if you succeed. So it just makes all the pain you have to go through as a entrepreneur kind of worth the run. Um, anyway. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for, for sharing your insights today. Thank you for bringing Two Bear Capital to Montana. We can't wait to see uh -huh. what's ahead in the rest can't of the Can't wait till we can see faces again. This is oh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, we, we missed the face-to-face -face interaction for sure. Well, thank you again, Mike. You have a great, great day. Thanks. See ya.